Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very pleased to have on the podcast Stephen Nadler. Stephen is the VLOS Research Professor and the William H. Hay II Professor of Philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's also the director of the UW-Madison Institute for Research in the Humanities. He is the author of numerous books, uh, one of them a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and has done much of his research around Spinoza, which many of his books are on, including the most recent book, Think Least of Death, Spinoza on How to Live and How to Die, and that is the book we talk about in this conversation. We start the conversation by talking about uh, kind of a really good overview. He does it in the book, and we do it in the conversation about Spinoza's philosophy. We talk about Spinoza's God and his connection with nature. We talk about how humans are included within nature and the role of free will. We talk about Spinoza's moral philosophy. We also talk about how humans are always moving towards preservation. Um, we spend some time talking about how to get the most accurate reading of Spinoza and kind of his uh, method and style of, of studying Spinoza's philosophy. We talk about what is the free person for Spinoza, how Spinoza views emotions, Spinoza on honesty, and how to live the good life. Um, I have to say, I'm really happy to have uh, Spinoza's philosophy on the podcast um, I've been wanting to talk about Spinoza um, here for quite some time, and I couldn't think of anybody else I would rather uh, talk about Spinoza with. So now I bring you Stephen Nadler. I'm here with Stephen Nadler. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for, for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, very excited to talk to you. Well, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, before we get into your wonderful book, just tell uh, folks really quick um, who you are, what you do, what you study, all the, all the particulars. So I've been teaching at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for 34 years, um, and I'm in the uh, professor of philosophy here and also director of the Institute for Research in the Humanities, uh, originally from New York, hmm. uh, but have been out here quite a while. Yeah, that's great. I've been to Wisconsin twice, and every time I go up there, it's it's very nice. People are nice, but it's very cold all the time when I go, <laughs> when I go there. Well, it's cold in the winter. It's a long winter, but the, yeah. we get four really nice seasons, and the summers are quite hot. So There you go. There you go. You have, you've written a, a handful of books, uh, and I know you've written a bunch on Spinoza. Uh, the most recent is Think Least of Death, Spinoza on How to Live and How to Die. Uh, it's a beautiful cover, and it's a fabulous book. Fabulous book. Thank you. Um, since you've written it about, I'm assuming, taught on him as well, what was kind of the major thing you were trying to say or get at with this book, especially if you've written about him previously? Well, in this particular book, I decided to take a deep dive into his moral philosophy. I mean, for a long time, Spinoza was treated mainly as somebody who did epistemology and metaphysics and for teaching was a nice convenient link between Descartes and Leibniz. Mm -hmm. um, and so students often only read parts one and two of the ethics where Spinoza lays out his views on God, on the human being, on knowledge, on um, freedom and so on. Um, and then they're left wondering, well, why in the world is this book called Ethics? Um, there's been a lot of really good work lately in the last uh, 10 years or so on Spinoza's moral philosophy and his political philosophy. But I really wanted the opportunity to look closely at the different ways in which he um, analyzes the life of the free person, the virtuous life, the life of reason, and how such an individual who's flourishing with rational virtue thinks and behaves. And then to look very particularly at specific virtues, uh, honesty, courage, uh, what he calls tenacity, uh, benevolence, and so on, and give a nice, I hopefully clear picture of what Spinoza stands for as a moral thinker, how he conceives of the best kind of life for a human being, mm -hmm. and how we can achieve that life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very nicely put. I would have to say the first, I think, two chapters, maybe two or three chapters. I'm not a big, uh, obviously, uh, expert in Spinoza. I haven't read a lot of him, uh, and, and I haven't read him in a while. So it was a little bit of the cobwebs sorting out for me. But your first two chapters in the book were 
probably some of the best synthesis I've read on Spinoza's philosophy. It was like, wow, it's just all kind of there, and you you write write about it very well. Maybe you could just talk about briefly because it kind of comes up, and you start the the book with this is Spinoza's God. Um, obviously, it's a very big topic, something he uh, he talks about a lot, but. What is Spinoza's God, and, and how does he equate that with, uh, with nature? So you can just kind of lay that out for us. Sure. Yeah, and it's important because even though his main project is ethical and the nature of a good life, it's all based on certain metaphysical foundations. And one of the most important of those foundations is eliminating the kinds of superstitious beliefs, um, and especially the superstitious belief in a providential personal God, uh, because these beliefs leave us in a state of bondage. If you believe that God is literally like the Abrahamic God, a kind of personal agent with certain psychological and moral characteristics, like um, making commandments, having expectations, and issuing rewards and punishments, if you think that that's what God is like, then your life is going to be dominated by irrational passions like hope and fear, hope for eternal reward and fear of eternal punishment. And so uh, part one of the ethics, which is his philosophical masterpiece, is devoted to showing that that can't be what God is, that that's just an incoherent notion of God. God simply is the infinite eternal substance of the cosmos, or nature, as he calls it. Mm. And nature um, doesn't have any of the psychological or moral characteristics traditionally attributed to God. Nature doesn't make demands on us. It doesn't issue laws. It doesn't reward or punish us in any kind of intentional way. Uh, nature is neither wise nor just nor good. Whatever is, just is. And whatever happens in nature follows from nature's laws and through nature's causal processes with absolute necessity. And once a person comes to understand that and dispel that superstitious picture of God, um, you're one of the, you've made an important step towards the life of the free person, and you can begin to have a better understanding of what you are, what the world is. So is, what, is, what does Spinoza mean when he says God is nature? I think what he means is all there is is nature. Mm. Now, there are some people who read him as being a kind of pantheist, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that there's something still religious or divine about nature. I think that's the wrong way to read him. Uh, the pantheist, even though they may deny any such thing as a transcendent supernatural God. The pantheist still believes then that if God is nature or God is in nature or nature is in God, then nature is deserving of some kind of worshipful awe or religious reverence. And it, it, to me, it's pretty clear that Spinoza believes that regarding nature with worshipful awe or religious reference is just the wrong attitude to take. The, the proper attitude to take towards nature is to understand it through science, through the intellect, by coming to know its laws and why things happen as they do. So mm. to, to me, Spinoza is an atheist. All there is is nature. Mm. And so he makes this claim that everything is in and from nature, right? That because, because of what you just laid out, nature is all there is, right? So would this mean that also humans, since we're also a part of nature, that nature is governing human affairs, right? And if that's the case, how does that play out according to Spinoza? Uh, that's absolutely right. He says quite explicitly, it's impossible for a human being not to be a part of nature, mm. which means not just our bodies are subject to the physical laws of nature. Um, you know, we stub our toes, we get paper cuts, things fall on us and they hurt. And our body is subject to all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. But at the same time, the human mind, which is intimately connected with the body for Spinoza, it's really just the mental correlate of the body and its, its states. Uh, the human mind is likewise subject to deterministic laws. So just as one physical event in the body follows another physical event, food falls into the digestive tract, it's addressed by acids and goes through the process of digestion according to very strict causal processes. So events in the mind follow very strict causal processes. Uh, mm -hmm. Beliefs are determined by other beliefs, which uh, give rise to desires, which give rise to intentions, and so on. And in part three of the ethics, Spinoza really does give us uh, a nice map, 
uh, of what a deterministic psychology looks like. Why do people love? What is joy? What is sadness? Why do people love? Why do they hate? Where does envy arise? Um, what is vengeance? What are feelings of hope? What are feelings of despair? All explained um, according to what he presents as geometrically precise laws. So yes, the human being, both in our physical and our mental lives, are just as subject to nature's deterministic processes as leaves falling off trees and rocks rolling down hills. Mm. By by this logic, then, you, you would maybe make the case that, well, Spinoza doesn't believe in free will, right? We, we, everything's deterministic then, yeah? If, if we have nature is having a, a set of laws and it's just uh, charting its course, then there is no free will, or, or does he take the compatibilist kind of uh, mode here? Or how, how do we understand Spinoza in regards to free will? Well, we don't have to make the case for him that there's no free will because he does it himself quite explicitly. Um, will, there's, unlike Descartes, who distinguishes uh, two faculties of the mind, the understanding and the will, Spinoza doesn't say that these are two distinct faculties, that every mental event has both a representational or cognitive component and an affective or connotative component. And so what we call willing really is just a feature of our regular thoughts. When I, when I think, for example, of, of a unicorn, I'm making a kind of mental assertion. Um, I may not be asserting that the unicorn actually exists, but I am making a kind of propositional assertion in my mind that here is a horse with a horn on its head. Mm -hmm. um, and there's uh, an affirmation involved in or denial, an affirmation or negation involved in all of my thoughts. And that's what willing is. But all of the mind's ideas are subject to causal factors. So I will make this mental affirmation, or I will have a desire or make a choice or an act of or a volitional action. Um, but it will always be determined by some prior mental event. So there is no free will, there's no will, mm -hmm. and there's no freedom of the will. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think it is somewhat correct, though, to call him a compatibilist in the sense that he is willing to say that there is a kind of freedom that human beings can achieve, not a freedom of the will, um, and it's certainly not a freedom without determinism. So he is a compatibilist in that sense. He's willing to say that human freedom is compatible with causal determination, as long as the determination comes from our own resources from within us. Mm. What human freedom consists in is a kind of autonomy from the kind of external constraint that things outside of us impose on us. Mm. So for example, um, if I choose to do something because of the pleasure I anticipate it will bring me. So I choose to have a, a fourth piece of chocolate cake because I anticipate it being a very pleasant experience. <laughs> I'm really not being very free there because I'm reacting to the chocolate cake and the delectable enticement it presents to me. I'm not really in control of the situation. Whereas if I decide um, not to have that piece of chocolate cake because I know that it will not be good for me. I'll feel a little yucky afterwards. I, I'm better off eating the apple. Well, that choice is determined not so much by the delection of things outside of me, but by my knowledge, my internal mm -hmm. cognitive resources about what's really in my own best interest. And to the extent that I am moved by my knowledge and not by the pleasures of the senses, I'm in control. I'm acting autonomously. And that's what freedom is. When really when what I do and what I think is governed not so much by bodily pleasures and pains or by the passions, but mm -hmm. by reason. Mm. Is, it, is it a type of kind of a illusory kind of free will, right? Where we're having this idea about something that we're doing or not doing, but in reality that we, we aren't actually, but it's the idea or the illusion of the free will that he's speaking of, or is it something different? Well, we are truly free. It, really free to the extent that we are acting rationally. Mm. Um, the belief in free will, I mean, you're right, though, that those who do believe in something called free will, 
And if they think of that free will as modeled in the libertarian sense, where mm -hmm. all things being equal, you, you chose A, but you could just as well have chosen B. If that's what you think your freedom consists in, then you are subject to an illusion. Mm -hmm. As he says quite clearly, the only reason you would believe that is if you are ignorant of the causes that are actually determining your choices and decisions mm -hmm. and desires. Yeah, yeah. This is always such a, I mean, I don't believe in free will either, <laughs> but it's always such a very, it's a sticking point for people. I think it's because of that kind of libertarian uh, component to it. I uh, also think there's an element of wishful thinking that yes. people want to think, want to believe that they're not determined. Mm -hmm. Um but it's really hard to ignore the evidence that so much of what we do, if not everything that we do, all the choices we make are governed by our desires. Our desires are governed by our beliefs and mm -hmm. our beliefs are often governed by um, values or character, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet at the same time, we are free in a sense, in the, in the sense that we are responsible um, for that what we do is an expression of who and what we are. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, of one's temperament, their character, their personality comes out in, 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 in that uh, kind of mode of things. You mentioned yeah, it. the problem with libertarianism is that it means your choices and your volitions are not expressions of who mm -hmm. or what you are. They're right. just these random events that went one way, but could just as well have gone another way. Yeah. I think that's a pretty strong critique of the libertarian view of free will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. You, you mentioned at the beginning that this was a, you wanted to look at his moral philosophy. And so you, how is Spinoza's philosophy a, a, a type of, or how does he have a moral philosophy and, and how do we understand his use of Edo, um, monia. my Greek is rusty, but uh, yeah, monia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that's the right term to use to describe his moral philosophy. He's definitely in the eudaimonistic tradition. Um, for listeners who are not familiar with eudaimonia, that's the term that Aristotle, for example, uses um, to describe uh, the true and highest human good. It usually gets translated as happiness, but I think a better translation is flourishing or well-being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Moral philosophies in the eudaimonistic tradition put the emphasis on becoming a certain kind of person, living a certain kind of life, and achieving the best kind of life for a human being that is flourishing as a human being. And I think Spinoza's moral philosophy falls nicely in that tradition. Um, it's not a moral philosophy of duties. It's not a moral philosophy of consequences. It's not actions are right because they have these consequences and actions are wrong. So mm -hmm. if you want, you, you really couldn't classify him either as a Kantian, although he, he does sometimes issue Kantian um, uh, pronouncements, but he's, he's certainly not a Kantian, a von um, Neither is he a utilitarian. Um, he is a kind of virtue theorist in that what mm -hmm. we should strive for is to become a virtuous person. Yeah. And a virtuous person is a person who achieves a certain degree of rationality, a certain degree of autonomy in what they do, and exercises the virtues to the extent that what they do is an expression of this rational, uh, this rational understanding of things. Yeah, and I feel like sometimes people misunderstand Aristotle's philosophy, I think misunderstand uh, Spinoza's philosophy of kind of smuggling in some type of religious component. And, you know, <laughs> I don't think that's really necessary. The higher good is this type of this aspirational kind of uh, uh, heights we're trying to reach, right? Whether it's well-being or whether it's flourishing or whether it's, you know, something that is bigger or higher than ourselves. Um, something that we're trying to 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 seek in a in a positive way, I guess you could say, and you can you can have that from nature, from 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 the self, uh, removed from uh, any deity or any any type of religious structure. And not to say that there aren't some some uh, you, um, utilities or positive aspects to that for some people. Um, you mentioned the the infinite and the finite modes, and this is kind of getting in the weeds here so you don't have to get too much into it i know it's it's really tough uh, <laughs> uh to to do that um but just kind of maybe give us the the snapshot of the, the infinite and the finite sure um so there is only one substance that is there's only one nature mm -hmm. there's only one god however whatever term you want to use 
And this substance is the infinite eternal foundation for everything. Um, but it's also an active thing. Uh, nature is active. It, it, is it has power. And this power expresses itself in different ways. Um, one of the infinitely many ways in which this power expresses itself is through what Spinoza calls the attribute of extension, which is um, just three dimensionality. So when you take power and you run it through this attribute of extension, you get bodies in motion and rest. Um, and the, the extent of bodies in motion and rest is itself infinite and eternal. There always have been, there always will be bodies in motion and rest, and there is no end to this realm of bodies in motion and rest. Uh, another one of the infinite attributes that nature expresses itself through is thought. And this gives rise to infinite ways of thinking, infinite modes of thinking, uh, which can also be called minds. And again, there are an infinite number of minds, uh, always have been, always will be, so eternally present. There will always be bodies, there will always be minds. And then there are infinitely many other attributes of nature, which we don't really have any cognizance of. Um, the particular bodies that are finite and determinate expressions of nature's power in extension, um, these are things like our bodies, the giraffe body, the tree, um, and these are finite modes of nature, particular and determinate finite expressions of nature's power. So your body and my body are distinct um, material or physical expressions of the infinite power of nature. Hmm. Similarly, your mind and its thoughts and my mind and its thoughts are discrete and distinct finite expressions of nature's power run not through extension, but through thought. So your mind is a finite mode of nature and my mind is a finite mode of nature. In, in these ways, when we understand these two kind of, I don't want to say these, these two uh, polarities, right? Is a, maybe not the best way to put it, but how can we derive then this idea of good and bad, right and wrong, these types of morals that we have for Spinoza, right? Is for him, there is no universal, there is no, uh, you know, absolute way of thinking this is you know to go to war is wrong and to be a pacifist is right or whatever how do we understand the kind of moral top spin that he's is he kind of a moral relativist is he an absolutist or how do we understand how morals fit into these kind of structures this is a, one of the complicated questions that uh, seasoned spinoza scholars love to fight about um, one thing is absolutely clear that nothing taken by itself is good or bad so there, it's true, there are, there are no intrinsic or absolute moral values. Um, nothing without relationship to anything else has any moral value, positive or negative. Some people have read Spinoza as a kind of uh, subjectivist or uh, moral anti-realist, whereby good and bad are just ways in which we think about things. Mm. And that makes moral values, good and bad and right and wrong, thoroughly mind dependent or in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. So it's good on this, on this subjectivist reading or anti-realist reading, something is good if you think it's good and you may think it's good and I may think it's bad and we'll just have to agree to disagree. I think that's the wrong way to read Spinoza. He's definitely not an absolutist but I, I read him as a moral realist. That is, there are, some, there are basic moral facts. However, they are um, relational facts. So there are certain things that truly are good, but only in relationship to an individual. So let's, let's take the individual human being, as opposed to, say, a tree or a giraffe. Um, there are some things that bring about an improvement in the condition of a human being. Uh, water, uh, nutritious food, knowledge, these things improve a human being and bring that human being closer to the ideal condition uh, to flourishing. Mm. 
there are other things which um, have a, a bad effect on human beings that, that they weaken our condition. Mm. Um, they don't weaken our condition because we think they do. They really do weaken our condition. Mm -hmm. uh, arsenic, um, grain alcohol, the, these things uh, may bring, uh, let's say, uh, a, a dangerous, potent, but um, pleasurable drug, may bring a short-term pleasure, but in the end, it brings about a weakening of your condition. And so these things, in fact, are bad mm. relative to us. Mm. Um, they may not be bad relative to all things. What may be bad for human being might be good for a squirrel mm -hmm. or good for a tree. Mm. Uh, and what's good for a human being might be bad for some other type of creature. But none of this makes good and bad or right and wrong subjective. It just makes them um, relational, mm. but nonetheless objective. So I think there really is uh, an object of good and bad. Now, Spinoza doesn't his what his morality is not it's not a morality of duty it's not like if an action is right you have a duty to do it mm -hmm. or if an action is wrong you have a duty not to do it mm -hmm. so in that sense he's very far from a kantian view of ethics but um, it is in your own best interest to pursue what's truly good and it is contrary to your own best interest to pursue what is bad mm. yeah that's I, I like the way you explain that as a kind of moral realist um i think that that's 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 important in the way you spell it out um we obviously know that there are things that are going to break down our body from being able to flourish in the best way that we can you know if i eat mcdonald's or if i eat donuts every day that's probably not good if i drink every day you know that's that's probably not going to be good for my body my mind my emotional state etc and there are other things that can do the opposite and so i, I like the way you kind of explain that in that way how then are humans seeking preservation, right? How can an individual be active or passive in their changes to their uh, conditions? And, and then well, I guess we'll get into the, the passions a little bit later. But how are humans kind of seeking towards preservation? Well, you, you can't not seek preservation. That's what we are. <laughs> that's, our, that's sort of our core motivational urge. Um, he calls it conatus, everything in nature, not just human beings, but plants and animals are all striving to persevere. They're striving to maintain themselves and even increase their power. Uh, the question is, are you doing that well or are you doing it poorly? Mm -hmm. You're doing it well if you're doing it under the guidance of reason. That is, if the things you seek are things that you know through understanding will indeed contribute to your perseverance. Mm -hmm. You're doing it poorly if you're being led not by your understanding, but by the imagination or by your senses, by what he calls inadequate ideas, in which case you'll be pursuing things that might be pleasurable in the moment, but in the end will bring about a weakening of your condition. Mm. Um, and so it all depends upon what this fundamental, even foundational urge for preservation, how it's being led. Um, you can't not strive to persevere, but you can do it well, you can do it badly. I'm going to just bring in two thinkers that are more recent. Um, it sounds when I was reading the book, and and I don't like doing this usually. I like to just keep people on their on their own merits. But it does sound like there is a lot of Nietzsche's philosophy, maybe being a uh, uh, maybe he had some. I don't know if he read Spinoza, but there is a lot of overlap between much of their thought. Um, and I, I don't know if you've read comparative kind of. Uh, uh, literature on this or any thoughts on that and then on the last point you were talking about in terms of preservation <clears throat> this does sound in, in some ways and it's at a very basic sense a, a type of way in which um you know freud's model of ego uh, id ego and super ego we have these how do we how do we live and how do we preserve and how do we how do we thrive and how do we have um you know a super ego that helps kind of manage us uh, give us a sense of, of right and wrong or an ethics and not be <laughs> ruled over by our id passions and the ego with the kind of balancing notion. But I don't know, how do you, I guess just a little bit here since we've been talking about it, where do you see maybe his impact or, or his philosophy on other thinkers, maybe at large and, and maybe those two in particular? 
I thought you were going to bring in Schopenhauer with the will. Well, to power Schopenhauer, as when we're well. talking about freedom of the will, yeah. I definitely thought about Schopenhauer as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm hesitant to pronounce. I'm, you know, I've not read enough Nietzsche. Uh, so Nietzsche certainly knew Spinoza. Um, so did Freud. So did Marx. So did Schopenhauer. Um, it really was hard to avoid him in the 19th uh, and even 20th centuries. Um, especially given certain intellectual orientations of a continental sort. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm really hesitant to say that, yes, this is similar to Nietzsche because my, my Nietzsche is not good enough to say. <laughs> yeah. um, but he's, he, he was, the thing about Spinoza is that he's, he's a bit of a, he, he can serve as a bit of a Rorschach test. People see in Spinoza what they want to see because yeah. his, the works are so multifaceted, but also so complicated, so opaque and dense that um, mystics see Spinoza as a mystic. Mm -hmm. um, socialists see Spinoza as a proto-socialist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, atheists see him as an atheistic hero. People see in Spinoza what they want to see. Mm -hmm. um, the Romantics, for example, um, people like uh, Coleridge, Novalis, and others um, saw Spinoza as a deeply religious individual. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I think everyone has their own Spinoza. Yeah. I, I don't know how much I, I always try. Maybe this is just like my old seminary training, but I, I always want to try and find kind of the author's intent. Yeah. Like, I don't want it to be, you know, you can be anything for all people, right? Like there is, I would assume, you know, and this might just be my priors, but that there is some intention behind what he was trying to say. Like there is a reading of it, not the correct reading, but that you're trying to get as close and as accurate to what he was trying to, to mean by what he was saying, that there is a closer reading of it. And so I don't know if you, I mean, obviously people fight about, you know, thinkers all the time or they fight about certain texts, but is there a danger in doing that where Spinoza can be anything for every, anybody, you know, for atheists and socialists and mystics, or how do we get a, a kind of closer, uh, or I should say a, a, an accurate reading of, of Spinoza and, and what his philosophy was trying to, to say? Well, I'd, I'd say the, the way you described it is pretty much my guiding principle. When I do history of philosophy scholarship, I'm interested um, primarily and understanding what this or that philosopher had to say. Um, and getting at that involves not just close reading of the text, but also um, understanding what they read, what were the mm -hmm. political and other historical circumstances of the composition. So for example, Spinoza's theological political treatise, I don't think you, could, you can really understand that without understanding the, um, the fraught situation of the Dutch Republic in mm. the late 1660s. Yeah, sure. uh, part five of Spinoza's ethics, I think, will be thoroughly incomprehensible to you unless you understand um, that Spinoza, closely read by Monides and other medieval Jewish rationalists, and that part five of the ethics is a kind of dialogue mm. with this medieval Jewish tradition of medieval Jewish rationalism. So I would say that trying to get at what a philosopher intended is that's my primary aim as a historian of philosophy mm. at the same time i also distinguish what i do and what many of my colleagues do from intellectual history and in that we're not interested just in understanding what a philosopher said mm. but whether they had good reasons for saying it mm. and so it's one thing to say that spinoza said this and here's why he said that because this is who he was reading but as philosophers, we also want to know um, what kind of arguments do they have for the theses they're presenting? Mm -hmm. Are they good arguments? Mm -hmm. um, should they have said that or should they perhaps have said something else? Um, mm -hmm. So I do think you know, people make fun of the should have, could have, would have mm -hmm. approach to doing history of philosophy. But I think there's a great deal of value to it, especially if you are being philosophical. Mm -hmm. You want to know not just what Spinoza did actually say, but what, what should he have said? For example, um, in the book, I address Spinoza's view on suicide. Yeah. And if you read the ethics itself, it looks like he's saying that rational suicide is not really possible. That if, if a person ends their own existence, it's not from reason, but from passion, from emotional feeling. But um, first of all, I don't, I don't think that's what Spinoza is actually saying. But even granting that that is what he's saying, I don't think he should have said that. I think much of what he says in, um, in the ethics would allow him to um, understand 
how rational suicide, how, how a person led by reason can willfully, intentionally, and correctly decide to end their own life. For example, um, if they are suffering from a painful uh, terminal disease that has no hope of improvement. Yeah. Yeah, that was a particularly interesting chapter in the book, which which um, which which I thought was interesting because you kind of have that kind of dialogue of you know kind of what he said and maybe what he should have said, which is especially for a, a tough a tough topic and subject like uh, suicide, and, and many people have had uh, discussions about uh, assisted suicide, etc. Um, before we move into some of the specific content areas, just one last big question, kind of from the first part of the book is. This idea of uh, the free person, we've kind of alluded to this earlier, is kind of the ideal human, right? So how how does he see freedom, the free person? How is it defined by activity? Um, how does he kind of explain uh, that in his philosophy? So the free person um, has been also subject to a lot of uh, contentious discussion. Um, <laughs> The free person has been claimed to be an impossible ideal. Some it, it would be an individual who's not subject to any passions whatsoever, but a pure uh, creature of reason. Um, but again, I think that's the wrong way to read it. Um, the free person, as I understand it, is simply an individual who has achieved such a level of rational virtue that even though they are subject to passions, to passive affects, you know, they they will stub their toe, they will burn their finger. Um, they will feel sadness at the death of a loved one. Um, so they are subject to these passive affects. But what makes them free is that they never let these passive affects, they never let their sadness or their bodily pleasures direct what they do. Mm -hmm. They are always guided by reason. And so the choices they make are always rational choices, unfailingly. Now, it, it certainly would be a very difficult position to achieve. Um, as he says at the very end of the book, all things excellent are as uh, difficult as they are rare. And so maybe nobody has ever actually achieved the perfect condition of the free person, but it's something we do strive for insofar as it represents the peak of our, of our power, the peak of our perseverance. Mm. Um, I would say for Spinoza, um, you're on the right track if you can see how the following things are all the same. Freedom, activity, virtue, rationality, autonomy, and eudaimonia, flourishing or well-being. They're all the same thing described from different perspectives. The free person hmm. is the person who's led by reason. And if you're led by reason, you're being active rather than passive. Hmm. And that's what virtue consists in, a kind of excellence in the pursuit of self-interest. Hmm. Yeah, it's it is very fascinating because people will hear those terms and think, oh my goodness, these are such loaded terms or terms they've heard. Like, oh my goodness, and um, I like how you put it. How it's you know kind of you just you just drill it all down. It's the same thing at bottom, but you're you're having different points of view there, which is which is very nice. So here's I guess my biggest thing, um, or I guess my my criticism, I guess, and this will 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 trend nicely, obviously, considering um, that I do clinical psych and everything. So he obviously talks about various emotions, and he has a huge emphasis on rationality and reason. How and so you mentioned in the book, he doesn't like these extremes, which which I, I would agree with. But how do we under, get a good understanding of his view of emotions? Based on the time in which he lived and how they understood emotions at the time? And this is a kind of what if, kind of should have, what if scenario. But do you think any of that would change based on, you know, robust literature we have on, the scientific literature we have on emotions now, on how they're a part of us as humans, how we can make good decisions using a combination of rationality and emotions, how they can be very grounded, rooted. Um, it's not a, uh, uh, an either or here. They're, they're all kind of integrated in our brain, in our minds. So maybe just tell us how he thought of it based on emotions um, at the time with the information he had and maybe what his philosophy would look like diff or how it would look different based on the information we know now about emotional theory research, et cetera. I, d I do think that to the extent that, and I remember for, for Spinoza, there, there are active emotions and passive emotions. 
um, the, the word he uses is um, affect um, and passive affects are changes in our condition brought about by external things and active affects are changes in our condition brought about from within us from by our knowledge um, and he's Spinoza's moral philosophy, I think, was deeply influenced by ancient Stoicism. Um, he, we know he read Epictetus and Seneca. And one important difference is that Spinoza does not think that the ideal condition is to be rid of the emotions, mm -hmm. to be rid of the passive affects. He thinks that's impossible. You can't not be a part of nature. You can't not have uh, passive affects or passive emotions. What we need to do uh, are two things. First of all, we need uh, in, in Spinoza's view, is to diminish their power over us. Mm. Um, you, you, it's not that the emotions, the past emotions, can make no contribution to our well-being. I, I don't think he, he goes that far. But you don't want to be led around by your passive mm. emotions, because yeah. then you're not in control. Yeah. Um, so the one thing we need to do is to diminish their power. But then the other thing we need to do is, whatever power they do have, harness them. Mm. Not everybody is going to be able to achieve the condition of the free person. Not everybody's a philosopher. Mm. In fact, most people will never live the life of the free person, the philosophical life, the life of reason. But uh, we do want all people to be virtuous or at least act in virtuous ways, even if they're not doing it from a deep philosophical um, condition of, of virtue. And the way to do that is to appeal to people through their emotions. And so, so one way to become, um, if virtue is defined as treating other human beings with justice and charity and benevolence and working to improve the lives of others, one way to become that kind of person is through philosophy, through reading Spinoza's ethics or <laughs> you know, achieving the life of reason, the life of understanding. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a person who has reached that superb condition of rationality, they will understand why it's in their own best interest to treat other human beings with justice, charity, and benevolence, because they will see that the more they improve the lives of others, the better it is for them. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to a point that Socrates makes in uh, Plato's dialogue, The Apology, Socrates is accused of corrupting his fellow citizens. Mm -hmm. And he says, do you think I'm an idiot? Why would I want to corrupt my fellow citizens? I have to live with these people. <laughs> no, my project is to improve them so that the people among whom I live um, care for the right things. Mm -hmm. I think Spinoza's point is very similar. That the, the truly philosophically virtuous person will strive to better the lives of others because she sees that it's in her own best interest to do so. Hmm. But most people can't achieve that state of rationality. How then can we get them to be virtuous? Well, you have to appeal to their imaginations and to their emotions. Hmm. And you do that by having them read morally edifying and inspiring stories like the Bible. Spinoza believes that the Bible is very well suited to inspiring people to moral behavior, not from a philosophical foundation, but from an emotional or imaginative foundation. They're inspired by, somehow Spinoza thinks that the Bible is filled with inspiring stories that will make us full of, of uh, justice and charity. I'm not quite sure I, I see the Bible in the same way, but he, do, he does think the prophets who wrote the biblical text um, were extremely morally gifted individuals, but also with vivid imaginations. And so they could tell really good stories that will inspire people. But let's say you read the Bible and it doesn't move you at all, but you read uh, Shakespeare or Dickens or Jane Austen, and it moves you. Those stories by Shakespeare or the, no the British novelists or whatever it may be, Russian novelists, they move you in ways that we could say are morally edifying. Um, yeah. Tolstoy, I think, was very clear about this, that mm -hmm. fiction had to be morally edifying. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And in fiction, whether it's the fictional stories of the Bible or the fictional stories of Shakespeare, um, appeals to the imagination. And so I think Spinoza grants that our emotions um, will, for most people, play a very important role in our moral and social and even political lives. 
Yeah, I definitely agree in terms of the power of, of narrative. I mean, narrative is is, is powerful. Uh, very, very good stories are, are super important. There's, there's almost just this human piece to it that we connect with, that we can share big ideas, you know, much better uh, through the power of narrative. I would agree with you about using the Bible, although I don't know if maybe there were other texts that weren't available at his time, but... I guess my problem with using the Bible as just uh, good storytelling, if you will, um, is it's it's very uh, latent with a lot of dogma and doctrine, and it's very hard to divorce just the stories from that. Um, and that's it's hard to parse that out. So I, I think maybe if someone can do that, sure. Well, but Spinoza it's hard. thought he could. Um, yeah. So, so in that sense, yes, I, I think it could be. I don't know if most people could, because most no. people, when they read the Bible, they're they are reading it for the doctrine. The doc, right. you can't, you can't. Say, and that's that wasn't its intentionality. I, I as, as as best as I can understand, this wasn't just, you know, some stories from Mesopotamia or whatever. This is this was, you know, a lot of uh, doctrine that was trying to be infused there. So it's it's kind of hard to you know, get outside of that web. So, but, uh, well, that's his, Spinoza, his point's great. Spinoza distinguishes. Um, so there are certain truths that the Bible conveys and mm -hmm. these are the moral truths, Treat yeah. other hum you know, love God and the golden rule your fellow human being right. with justice and charity. But right. then there's all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and all that other stuff, um, consists in, in a number of things. First of all, um, the people who wrote the Bible, while they may have been morally superior and, imaginatively gifted they were not philosophers or scientists or historians or they weren't even theologians mm -hmm. and so the way they depict god that's just how they happen to think about god doesn't mean it's true mm -hmm. uh, they you know if if you read the bible and you think that the sun goes around the earth well that may be what the prophet believed but the prophet was not a scientist mm -hmm. so we shouldn't read the bible as a source of scientific or philosophical or theological truths, right. we should only read, and those may be very entertaining and may make a contribution to getting the moral point across, but the only truth that comes out of the Bible is that moral one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then you have, and then you're talking about different levels of truth, which <laughs> is a bigger, longer conversation, but uh, yes, I, I, I would agree on, on that point. Um, you mentioned uh, acreasia, right? So this lack of power. Uh, yeah. Could you describe that concept and how does that work with rationality and irrationality, um, et cetera? Just kind of and and what Spinoza uh, means with this. Yeah, the classic problem of acrasia is um, why do we ever act contrary to our better judgment? Mm. Um, why do we ever do things that we know are wrong? Um, anybody who is a smoker knows, must know that smoking is bad for them, but they do it anyway. Um, I mean, we could say, well, there, look, there's a fundamental medical problem there of addiction. But, you know, students who have a test the next day, but go out partying, knowing that they really should stay home and study. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a, um, a familiar phenomenon. And it, the this philosophical discussion of it go back to antiquity. Yeah. Um, Plato, for example, believed that the reason why we ever act contrary to our better rational judgment is because we have a, the, the soul is divided and there's a battle between the rational part and the spirited part, um, the passionate part. And sometimes the passionate part beats the rational part. Um, Spinoza doesn't see the mind as divided in this way. Um, he doesn't think you have reason on one side and emotion on the other. And so if, you know, if I, I know I shouldn't have that fifth piece of chocolate cake, reason tells me that, but my uh, appetite pulls me in that direction. Um, that's not quite how it works for Spinoza, because for Spinoza, even our rational beliefs have an affective component. So it's not mm -hmm. reason versus affect, but rather it's affect versus affect. The, the, the human mind for Spinoza is a, a battleground of affects. Mm. And the more powerful affect, the, the stronger feeling or the stronger emotion will win. If it so happens that the rational emotion, that is the affect that is a part of my rational ideas that tell me not to eat the cake, if that affect is weaker than the passionate, 
affect, my bodily desire for the pleasure of eating the cake, then I'm going to eat the cake. Mm -hmm. And that's what weakness consists in. Um, the other translation of akrasya is incontinence, which has, you know, un unfortunate connotations these days. It doesn't mean, it does mean you can't control yourself. It's that's a lack right. of control. Literally, yes, right. And it's not a lack of bladder control. It's, it's a lack of, of um, right. willful, you know, control over what we choose to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's I think that's uh, that's very helpful. It's in some ways he's um, kind of before his time because we understand that now uh, that there is affect within rationality. We understand that these things are integrated, and so I think the way he's he's seeing the whole picture here is is really important with these things. Um, I just have two two final questions before kind of we can end with a, kind of like a, a big I guess applied one, if you will. Although all of it's kind of applied, but. Um, Honesty. He he talks about you, know, you talk about in the book and his views on honesty, and I, you kind of like with the, the the topic of suicide. You kind of, if I recall, uh, talk about you know maybe it's this, maybe it's not. Is a kind of like a dialogue you're having in the chapter, which is really nice. What can we say his ideas were about honesty? Was it kind of conflictual? How do we understand how he viewed honesty? So one of the more difficult propositions of the ethics is where he says that a free person um, will always act um, on it. Well, you know, I'm using one translation or another, will always act honestly and never deceptively. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's not a great translation of the Latin. Um, but the question is, is it the case that reason will always dictate telling the truth? And we, you know, we can think of a lot of very clear moral situations where um, the rational thing to do is to be dishonest. If the Nazis come to your door and ask, "Are you hiding a Jewish family in your in your attic?" Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, um, one of my loved ones says, um, "Do you like my hat?" <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> um, honesty may not be the most rational policy. So, really, how can Spinoza mean this? Um, and um, some scholars have argued, well, he doesn't really mean it. He doesn't mean always telling the truth. He means acting with good faith, even mm -hmm. perhaps sometimes acting with good faith means telling a falsehood. Uh, another way of reading it, though, uh, is this. Um, the, the free person has reached such a condition of rational virtue uh, and kind of human flourishing that they don't want to fall short of that condition. And yes, sometimes you could preserve your existence. You could persevere by telling a falsehood. But the free person is interested not merely in persevering in existence, but persevering in this condition of rational perfection. And the free person... And I, I think this is a plausible reading. The free person will f will will understand that even the smallest acts of dishonesty create divisions between people mm. and bring us a little bit further away from that condition of rational perfection. Mm. And so, in this case, the free person would rather tell uh, tell the truth at the risk of their life because the alternative is telling a lie and sort of diminishing the condition of that life, creating social conditions which are not conducive to the life of reason. It's, it's interesting because it's, it's a, it's a, when I was reading the chapter, it was something I also wrestled with as well, where I just, it's, it's hard to really, I don't, I, I don't know if I'm an absolutist on this. I, I, I don't know. My, my views are always shifting and moving and it's hard to, to really know, you know, how does it, it, it I, I can't help but think that it's not context dependent. Sometimes I think maybe in many ways it is right to be very honest. I think that's good in, in, in his construct, you know, kind of the, the free person. But you can also think of situations where maybe it wouldn't be, and yeah. it's it's a it's a conundrum. 
Here I think uh, Spinoza is quite close to Kant, who you know, Kant really bit the bullet on this. You tell the truth, even when those Nazis come knocking at your door, you have a moral duty to tell the truth. Uh, and if you tell a lie, um, you're responsible for the consequences of that lie, especially if those consequences um, turn out to be exactly what you're trying to avoid. Yeah. At one point, Spinoza says, um, if reason if reason allowed us to be dishonest, it would allow everybody to be dishonest. Mm. And that's incoherent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know the exact words, but something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think here we might depart from Spinoza a bit and think, no, this, this can't be right. He's being, either he doesn't mean always telling the truth, he just means always having good faith. And the Latin suggests that. Mm -hmm. Or we have to say, um, we disagree. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of other other human beings, uh, other humans, uh, relationships. So he says a few things about friendships, uh, different different types of relationships. You know, how should we treat our fellow human? Right? Is this that kind of, you know, what does the golden rule tell us, or or other other uh, types of uh, wisdom teachings from certain texts, or uh, that can tell us we should treat people fairly, humanely, justly, or what, what does Spinoza believe in how, how we should treat uh, other, other humans and, and, and different types of relationships? He thinks that it's our own best interest to um, improve their lives and make them rationally virtuous. And so if I'm a rationally virtuous person, um, I will act out of, of a full awareness of how it's to my own benefit Everyone for Spinoza is motivated by this fundamental striving to persevere. So there's this basic egoism at the heart of moral motivation. And the rationally virtuous person will understand that it's in their own best interest to treat others with benevolence. People who aren't rationally virtuous should still treat others with benevolence, but they will more likely do so from feelings of sympathy or pity or even hope and fear. Um, that's not the, the most solid foundation for moral behavior. Um, passions come and go. Uh, the better foundation is to understand why other people should be treated with justice and charity. Uh, and Spinoza quite clearly says that to be benevolent out of pity, that's not good. That's a kind of sadness because pity is a feeling of sadness in uh, witnessing the the travails of others. Mm. Um, better to be benevolent um, out of a feeling of hope, mm. still not great, because hope is, is also a passion, mm -hmm. or, or feelings of sympathy or feelings of joy. But best of all is to be benevolent towards others uh, from reason, understanding. Mm. Mm. It reminds me of, again, Nietzsche also didn't like pity, but also reminds me of some of the work that uh, Paul Bloom has done, where he talks about how we need to have compassion to make our moral decisions as opposed to just sympathy or pity or things like that. And so yeah. and this is very, very fascinating. The, the last question I have for you is, um, you know, for, you know, according to Spinoza, what's the right way to live, right? We're on this planet for very, you know, not even, you know, a blink in the grand scheme of things. And, you know, what's, what's the right way to live? How, how are freedom and rationality important ingredients uh, for active and healthy living? Well, I did leave out when I gave you that equivalence between freedom, activity, rationality, mm -hmm. and virtue, I left out one very important thing, and that is uh, joy and happiness. And the best kind of life, the life of reason, the life of understanding, the free life, the life of activity, is also the most joyous life. It's a life in which you are not focused on death. You're not anxious about death because you know there is no such thing as an afterlife. So you're not right. overly worried about whether you're going to enjoy eternal reward or suffer eternal punishment. Um, your attention is focused on the joys of this, the joys to be achieved in this life through virtue. Uh, and that is what it is to flourish as a human being. Uh, and it also requires a, a, a social and political context. You, you can't really live this life of freedom, activity, rationality, virtue, and joy unless there are others doing it as well because it becomes a mutually supportive community. 
Yeah, there, there, there is with his philosophy and many other philosophers as well, this type of uh, interdependence is the, the word we use now. It's a very essential piece. And I think it's essential, maybe potentially because of, you know, us as social kind of animals. You know, that's kind of some, some ways in which the wiring is. Um, well, the book is called Think Least of Death. Spinoza on how to live and how to die. Uh, it's out now. It's been out. Uh, where can people find it? And where can people find you and your other books and your work and any any of the relevant places? Well, the, the book should be at fine stores everywhere. Um, I encourage you to go to your uh, local independent bookseller. Um, if you must go online, uh, bookshop.org, you can order it there. Um, and there are, as you know, other online resources for ordering books, which I won't mention. <laughs> but, you know, try your local independent bookstore. Just go online and find a small bookstore, independent bookstore. Um, people who want to know more about my work uh, can find me on the website of the philosophy department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. <laughs> and there they'll see um, they can find uh, titles of other books I've written and articles. Yeah, that's 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 great. Uh, well, look, uh, you know, Stephen, this was uh, such a such a wonderful conversation. I mean, I, I loved your book, and um, I've really enjoyed uh, this conversation, uh, talking about uh, Spinoza's philosophy and, and some of the the power that it has and how relevant it is for for everyone. So I, I can't say enough thanks for you to come on and, and talk to all of us about uh, Spinoza and, and, uh, and all of your work uh, and, and research on. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you.